we shall be at with a letter that is addressed to the city council that essentially is just asking for a high level of awareness and priority for the homelessness problem and the housing challenges in our community. Um, and then also some accountability for the camping ban that was just um, in, approved and in, imposed. Um, and so there's more information up there, and you can talk to Mission and Outreach folks. Uh, this is something that a number of churches are going to be collaborating together on over the next several months leading up to the election. And so it's a timely time for us to have Dave here. So welcome, Dave. He is the... Uh, I, I looked up your title or, or before, and you, your community director something or other. There's yeah, there's a few of them. Yeah. So, but, but housing in Olmsted County. And so we turn it over to him, and thank you so much for being here. Thanks so much, Pastor Tim. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today and uh, speak with you all on this, I would say wonderful morning. I do think it's a wonderful morning because we get to be here together. The weather might be a little bit otherwise, but uh, it's not too bad out there. And as we get started, just a reminder, if you're looking for the Easter eggs, you are in the wrong place. So <laughs> I was assured that this is the only Easter egg in this room. So I kind of got here a little early and looked around and couldn't find any other ones. So I, I think that's probably true. So again, my name is Dave Dunn. I serve as the Housing and Planning Director for Olmsted County, and a big part of what I have been doing lately is talking to groups like yours about housing and homelessness in Olmsted County. And so I was very pleased to have an opportunity to come here this morning and share just a little bit about kind of the lay of the land with all of you, and then hopefully a little bit of conversation afterwards. The first kind of thing I wanted to just talk about very briefly are some definitions because I think one of the many things in the housing world that's complicated that we probably make over complicated is we have terminology for things and uh, acronyms for things that nobody understands and so what I wanted to do is try to hopefully kind of clear some of that up. The first part of that is affordable housing. So if I was to go in and ask all of you what is the definition of affordable housing, I don't know, there's probably 30 people in this room, we probably have 30 different answers. And so one of the things that we've come up with to try to come up with a single definition is that affordable housing is affordable if you pay less than 30% of your gross income in rent or your mortgage payment. Uh, that, so then again, that even depends on your circumstances in life. But again, if you don't have a significant income, everything, uh, any rent is challenging to be affordable. Underneath that is workforce housing. So that's really uh, what a lot of the, what you're here about right now. And that's for people maybe who are a little bit higher up on the income scale that are working, that are those entry level workers. It can be everything from your daycare provider, coffee shop employees, your servers, in the community or hospitality industry, way up to teachers and police officers and things like that. And then finally, the third definition there is market rate housing. And that's really housing that can be produced right now by the private market. So housing is a continuum. So as we kind of think about it, and, and we'll talk about this as a continuum a little bit this morning, it really starts at the very bottom, unfortunately, with people who are experiencing homelessness. So you can see there on your far right, uh, kind of homelessness, uh, unsheltered, moving into an emergency shelter type situation, and then talking about transitional housing, kind of moving up there into your affordable rental, home ownership, uh, market rate rental, and then market rate home ownership. And again, the idea here is it's a continuum, it's not any just one kind of piece, and our continuum as a whole really needs to function. So it's important that as we think about having a healthy housing continuum, it's all the way from homelessness to homes for people who are very fortunate and well off in our community. And we need all of that. And in many places, we're not getting enough of several pieces of that. So all housing is good housing.
the next two slides talk about incomes and rents because I think that's another thing that people probably are just interested in. So this is the 2023 area median income for Olmstead County. So we get this information by household size and levels. And we, again, we try to make it a complicated table. For me, I think or what is the median income? And then a reminder for those of you who have not been in the math class for a while, like me, median income would be if we lined up all of the incomes in Olmstead County from lowest to greatest, the median is the one that is smack dab in the middle. So for a four person household, you can see when we talk about very low income, we're talking about that $33,000 a year. You can see that goes up until 100% of the area median income is $111,500 a year. And the second thing that we talk about here, just to kind of get us level, are what, what do we consider affordable rents? So again, affordability is based on an individual, but again, different systems have different rules, which is one of the many complicating factors in housing. And so this is when we talk about trying to baseline affordable rents, you can see that circled number right there. So right now for a two bedroom apartment, an affordable rent is $1,500 a month. For many of you, that might be greater than your mortgage payment. Uh, I know it was for me for many years, and that's one of the challenges that we see here in our community. So I wanted to start this morning by talking about homelessness for a few slides. We'll actually talk about homelessness, affordable rental housing, and then home ownership. So hopefully kind of move along the continuum as we have a little time together. I know this is an extremely, uh, sensitive issue right now. I know the city council's taken some action on the camping ban recently, and I know there's a lot going on in this arena. The first thing that we wanted to do is kind of try to level set as far as numbers go. I know that's always a challenge. The first question I always get is how many people are experiencing homelessness in Rochester? And that is a very challenging question to answer because it changes every day. And so what we have been able to do is we last did a kind of count in July, actually it should be July of 2023, not 2024. Hopefully that goes down, but in July of 2023, we had a team go out for a week and canvas the known campsites in the community, canvas parking lots, uh, kind of go out in the community at night and find how many people were out there that did not have a place, a shelter. And that number was 173. Another measurement are students that are considered uh, in transition, which means they do not have a stable home. The way that this works is that the uh, school district actually starts a count every July 1st, and they go one, two, three, four, all the way up to June 30th, and then they start over at zero. Anywhere from, so the question was defining students, anywhere K-12 or pre-K-12 if they're known to the school district. So maybe if they're in a preschool program or a special education program. So that would just be kids that are enrolled in a uh, Rochester or any other public school program in Olmstead County. So for this school year, that number is currently at 570 students, again, uh, that have had that instability. You know, when you talk about that and talk about the subsequent issues with educational achievement and moving from school to school, you can see how challenging that is. And then the third measurement that we looked at is that how many people have used our coordinated entry system, which is kind of a uniform system that many of our service providers here use. Uh, it's an opportunity to collect data on individuals and kind of learn more about what their needs are. And so 1,002 people used our coordinated entry, coordinated entry system in 2023. So you see there with those numbers that it kind of, it, one, it varies. There is, if you think of it, unfortunately, as a larger group of people who have 
severe housing instability, every day some of those people are finding housing, and every day some of those people may be slipping into homelessness. The other thing just to kind of start off in this area is to talk just a little about our shelter. So the Rochester Community Warming Center was founded in 2019. It is at 204th Street Southeast. It's right across the street from the Government Center. Uh, Catholic Charities of Southern Minnesota does an amazing job of operating that facility. They've done so since day one. Uh, but it's a little bit outdated and it's too small. We need a new facility. Uh, we had tried and attempted to move forward on that last fall and unfortunately we weren't successful but there's still a need in our community for new shelter space so as we talk about the future that is something that we are going to have to address as a community so there's shelter and then uh, kind of how are we addressing the issue of homelessness in our community and, and this is one of the first kind of key ways so this is called permanent supportive housing the idea here is that if we can get people into housing, if we can stabilize their housing, we can start to address some of those un other underlying issues that may be there, whether that's substance abuse, addiction, uh, mental health, whatever it may be. If we can stably house people and they're no longer having to fight every day to know where are they gonna eat and where are they going to sleep, there's time and less stress and an ability to start to really help and impact people. And so what we do at places like this, this is our actually, the picture here is our building at 105 North Broadway. It is named the 105. We are really creative in our naming in said County. We do a lot of things really well. Creativity is not always one of them. But here at the 105, uh, there's 18 single room occupancy units of housing. And what happens there are that people who were previously experiencing homelessness come in, they have a safe place to live, there's on-site staffing 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and there's on-site case management. So you're checking in with folks almost daily, you're able to kind of understand what's going on in their lives, where they're thriving, where there's challenges, and make those uh, course corrections along the way. The idea is then if you're able to stabilize folks, hopefully, and we have seen successes of this, that after maybe a year, six months, for some people it might take two years or longer to really stabilize them and then move them hopefully further up in the housing continuum. Again, trying to free up these units that are uh, of the highest level of service for people who need that level of service. Another investment that's being made right now is in family shelter. Uh, there's only three beds of family shelter available right now in Olmsted County. All three of those beds are at the Family Promise facility, the North Star House. And so one of the things that we did as a county is we looked at how could we help increase the family shelter capacity. And, and as part of that, we're partnering with Family Promise to acquire and renovate this building at 1621 10th Street Southeast. Right now it's named the 1621. <laughs> I told you, we're not creative. I think Family Promise, as they come on board, will find some kind of much more appropriate name for the facility that will be providing families with so much needed assistance. Uh, this new facility will serve eight to 12 families. It should be open by June. And then the last kind of part that just is like, before I talk about kind of moving forward that we're doing right now is a lot of outreach. Uh, the, the biggest thing we hear is why don't people accept help? You know, that's one of the, well, why don't, you know, we, we tried to help them and they don't want help, so we better just whatever, right? Fill in the blank. The reality is that homelessness is so traumatic and the level of trauma that people have experienced that have led to a lot of times where they're at is so severe that trust is extraordinarily challenging to build. In some cases, it can take years. In some cases, you just might not ever get there. But that doesn't mean that you shouldn't continue to try. 
And that's what it takes is that continued trying, that continued effort, that continued outreach with people to really have that connection be made. And so that's part of what we have here for our Empowering Connections and Housing Outreach Center, or ECHO Center. We did not name that 206. We probably should have. Uh, this is in the strip mall that was located right next to the where the warming center is across the street from the government center. It's a county-owned facility. I, I like to tell this story just a little bit because I think government sometimes gets a bad rap, and sometimes rightfully so, but I think this is really an example of government gone good. So the county owns this building that the warming center was in. It was very underutilized. This was actually a lawyer's office. The lawyer moved out. The space was empty. We were getting like $500 a month in rent. Something very, you know, and when you think of the $400 million county budget, this is a pretty insignificant amount of money. And so instead of looking to release this, what we decided to do was slap a coat of paint on there and see if we could better connect people to services if we were near them. And so noticing the need for people, especially in the morning, uh, when the warming center closed, when people were kind of leaving, we decided to take that space and turn it into an outreach center. And that was in uh, late 2022. It's been extremely successful. Uh, people come in, visit, uh, connect to services. People don't have to be experiencing homelessness to utilize this facility. A lot of them are, uh, but it really has been a great way. We have social workers there from 8 to, well, 7.30 to 2.30, Monday through Friday. So we're able to provide them with assistance, maybe connect them to other resources, so maybe somebody uh, struggling to get their SNAP benefits. We can help there. Maybe it's getting a driver's license. We can help there. So it's really kind of connecting with those things and connecting where we're at and, and where we're going. And so it's so important for us to uh, have that opportunity to connect. And so you can see there the work, you can see there the phone number. The other thing there is that housing is a process, it's not a transaction. Uh, that means that a lot of times, you know, you think of, oh, I should come here and, you know, I need a place, where's my keys? The reality is the challenges that led someone into experiencing homelessness will generally take a little bit of time to work themselves out. Could be as easy as just having an apartment available, could be needing to be able to address some other substance abuse, mental health issues, in order to help get them ready for housing. And so it takes time. So housing is a process, it's not a transaction. So as we kind of look at this and work through this, that's what having these connections allow it allows for those relationships. And when I remember talking about the trauma, the amount of time it takes to build that relationship in order to accept that help is really what this outreach is about. Next slide, come on. There we go. Uh, so, so that was kind of where we're at. Now I want to talk a little about where we're going. So in November, you had heard that uh, maybe some of you have heard, we applied, this, the Olmstead County applied for a state grant to build a new shelter facility. Unfortunately, that grant was denied. And as we really kind of took a minute and thought about it and really reflected on it, you know, maybe it wasn't such a bad thing uh, because it did a few things for us. Number one, it allowed us to kind of take a step back. We were really chasing a dollar amount from the state. So it really allowed us to be a little bit more strategic. It allows us to be a little bit more in line. It allows us to work with the community more uh, because of the timelines associated with the grant application. We really had to go extraordinarily quickly. So for us, I think what we've done is not just as the county, but what we've been able to do here is bring together a bunch of providers of services in the community. And primarily right now, we're focusing on the single adults uh, although we have significant relationships and partnerships with uh, Lutheran Services, uh, Rochester Public Schools and others, really focusing this kind of on that steering committee and the single adults to get started to say, how can we create a community plan and strategy to address homelessness systematically? 
So instead of trying to do one thing or another or kind of something else, how do we work together as partners and really truly build one system amongst these and other partners? So the framework that we've selected is really called Built for Zero. So I think that might be something that some of you have maybe heard in the news lately. I know that it's been talked about a little bit in response to the city county meeting that happened last week. Uh, it's really about, I mean, at its simplest form, it's community organizing. Built for Zero really tries to do two things. Number one, it gets a list of people who are experiencing homelessness in real time which again is a challenge because that changes daily. And the second thing it tries to do is match those people and families to services that, we re that they require in order to become housed. Uh, so really by doing those two things, we can make an impact. We know this, it's been done in over 100 other communities in the country. It's significantly reduced homelessness in many of those communities. And so by adapting, adopting this program or this process, and instead of having all of those different agencies that we were talking about trying to work on their own, what we've decided to do is to combine our efforts and work together. And so I know that the meeting that happened last week, I think there are a couple of comments here, some questions and, and conversation back and forth uh, as we were getting started about the city and county meeting last week. So for those of you who don't know, the city council and the county board uh, work very closely together, but it's not very often that they come together in formal meetings. I think the last one was in 2018 or something like that. But both entities really talked about the need to have joint leadership on the issue of unsheltered homelessness, and both entities really felt that it was important to come together. So on Wednesday afternoon, we had an opportunity to go to the Civic Center and visit with the City Council and the County Board. And what we really wanted to do was two things. The first, we wanted to give uh, an update on things and kind of the lay of the land and this new strategic vision that kind of is a group of service providers that we're moving toward. Uh, and then the second one is to get them to buy into our vision, our goal, and kind of our pathway forward. Now that's challenging for a City Council because, and the County Board, because they're used to having things that are right in front of them. Uh, agreeing to a vision is a big picture thing, it's a little fuzzy, it's a little out there a little bit, and so when you have uh, groups that are really used to making very specific decisions, yes, no, you know, thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, it can be a challenge. But actually the meeting went extraordinarily well. Uh, there was definitely consensus from our city partners and our county partners to move forward with this approach, which is really our community vision, which is to end homelessness by prevention, if at all possible. So the best way to end homelessness is not to have it happen in the first place. So that means investing in things like rental assistance, uh, eviction prevention efforts, uh, just having enough adequate affordable housing available in the community. Uh, but if it does happen, to make it rare, brief, and non-recurring. So do everything we can to prevent experiencing homelessness, have the resources available to immediately match someone or a family to the needs that they may have if they are experiencing homelessness, and move them back into housing as quickly as possible. That's, that's our vision. That's kind of the big picture. The nice thing is, is it's not controversial. Uh, there isn't really a group that says, gosh, we're pro-homelessness. <laughs> so that makes what we do, and, and that was part of why we wanted to have that level of conversation with our elected leaders. So instead of having the conversation, and especially in a week in which the city council had to follow up with the camping ban vote, and it was a four to three vote, and that would have been a very hard vote on both sides. Uh, I don't think that anybody, I think everyone appreciates all of the complexities involved, including the council members who voted for that. Uh, and I think it was just a very challenging vote. So again, where we're looking at these issues that are very emotional and divisive, let's really start to think about how can we work together and how can we get to a community in which we don't have to worry about that. 
And so that's really what this vision is about. It's really about how can we work together as partners, as a community, and make it where we don't, where we can end homelessness. And now when we say end homelessness, we do have, because I'm in government, I have to have some kind of caveat. The asterisks, if you will, there's, you can see there's quotation marks there. What we talk about is reaching what we call a functional zero, which means that you have a system in place that when people fall into homelessness on any given day, you have the systems in place to lift them out of it. So it isn't that there won't be anyone, unfortunately, that will have to go through that trauma, but the goal is to have a system in place to address it. And that is a, that is a goal that we can do, that is workable, that's achievable, that's definitely something that we can move forward on together. So like all good presenters, I realized halfway through this morning that I made a mistake. Don't worry, I'm going to try to fix it right here. So I put about an hour and a half worth of information into a presentation that was supposed to be 40 minutes. So what I'm going to do now is actually skip a little bit of this on rental housing. I'm going to go to one more slide on rental housing, and then I'm going to go to how can you all help. The rest of the slides are available to talk more about some of the work we're doing around creating affordable rental housing and creating affordable home ownership options. But what I want to do is make sure that we have plenty of time for conversation. So the last slide, and again, before I get into kind of how do we move forward together, is just you know another way to talk about the need in our community. So there are, you can see there, there are 65,000 640 households in Olmstead County, according to the latest American Community Survey, which is basically an updated version of the census. You can see that there are 46,000 roughly owner-occupied households and around 19 to 20,000 rental households. Of those 20,000 roughly rental households, just about half, 49.1% of those, pay more than 30% of their gross income in rent. So when we look at this from, you know, maybe when we first talked about that 173, and you keep kind of piling up, you know, for how many people are really in that pool of, of possibility, this is really what you want to think about, because these are, you know, there's, there's 8,000 households that really could use rental assistance that don't have it. And for those 8,000 households, and the reason I say 8,000 is I'm picking the 9,600 here, that could use rental assistance, I'm taking away the 1,400 that we do. It's probably 8,200 and something if I did exact math, but I'm not that good at math. And real numbers never really end in fives and zeros, but they're a lot easier to remember. So there's about 8,000 households, give or take, in Olmstead County who are one thing away from really having a challenge. And that could be a sick child, that maybe means that they don't have to, they can't get to work, could be a car breaking down, could be a lost job. Uh, another thing you see is a reduction in hours in a job because a lot of, you know, most of the time, the clients that we work with are employed, but the type of employment they have is not as stable or steady. You know, and so maybe they have 32 hours every week and all of a sudden that goes down to eight. And that isn't any fault of their own or anyone else, that's just the way that it is. So that's the need for rental assistance. That's kind of the overarching need and what we're doing. And now what I want to do is spend just a couple of moments at the end and go through a whole bunch of slides that will, like I said, we'll make sure that we have in the presentation and more than happy to share and talk about them afterwards. But I also, like I said, I know there's a time crunch here and I want to make sure that there's plenty of time for questions. Uh, so I want to talk about moving forward together. You know, I, the first time I gave this presentation, I realized that it was doom and gloom. There was all these issues and all these numbers and all these problems in our community. And I looked back and I said, you know, I didn't hit the mark there in kind of putting this together because honestly, I'm optimistic. I'm optimistic about our future as our community. I'm optimistic that we're going to address this issue and make this a priority and solve this issue. And I really, really am, and I've seen the great work that people do every day, 
And I can tell you that we are making progress. And so this, as we kind of wrap up, I know that there was the letter that Pastor Kem had talked about this morning to kind of have an opportunity to sign. And so I thought what I'd do is just kind of leave my last slide here as kind of that a little bit of a call to action. And I think the first thing that I would recommend is just being present. Uh, if you go on to the city and county websites, you can actually sign up to have those agendas delivered to your inbox. So kind of knowing what's going on at the city council, what's going on at the county board, what's going on at the Housing and Redevelopment Authority Board, which is the board that I work with most closely, uh, which actually oversees a lot of the funding that goes toward housing and homelessness. So understanding what's going on and what's coming up on the, those agendas is extremely important. And reaching out and ask, voicing support to your elected officials in a very polite way and thanking them for the work that they've done, encouraging them to continue the work that they're doing uh, is of utmost importance. I can tell you that the city council does generally get a crowd. I can tell you the county board meetings, if there were 10 people at a county board meeting, we'd wonder what was going on. <laughs> if five people emailed a commissioner before a meeting and said, hey, just want to thank you about this, or just want to you know, tell you to keep up the great work, or this is on the agenda and it's important to me, that makes a difference. The same holds true for the city council. So I think you know one of the things we think about is that we're just one individual, but by just utilizing our voice, we can be effective in just shaping the community narrative. The second one's really already started. I think you're building a movement already within the faith community. Uh, there's great work. I know this uh, church is involved with Isaiah. Several other churches are as well. Uh, it's been an op opportunity to work with them, I know, on kind of figuring out what are the opportunities within the community for us to collaborate as congregations and build a movement. You know, I mean, it's not just anyone. You know, it's, it's the power of the individual, which is there, and the power of the whole. Thirdly, it's, it's really maximizing your congregation's assets. So a lot of times I'm asked, well, what can, you know, we're such and such church, what can we do to help? Right, I, I think you know that that comes that becomes a real quick question we get a lot, and I think you know sometimes it's really just having that brainstorm about what are your congregation's assets. It could be that you have a very active group of volunteers. It could be that you have maybe donors who are looking to connect to different social justice issues. It could be that it might just be as simple as hey. We're, you know, we have a parking lot here. We were talking beforehand and there was a great conversation. It's George, right? Yeah. George and I were talking before we got started. He's, you know, one of the things I'm wondering about is, is there a need for just a safe parking place at night for people who are sleeping in their cars? Yeah. It's like, great. That's, that would be an amazing thing that could be done. Uh, and it's needed. There are people in our community who desperately need that. So as we start talking about those are things that are tangible, I feel like, that you can do to really start to have an impact. And it's really leveraging those assets, and every congregation's assets are different. And so I think it's just talking about what truly are those assets, and how do we, how do we mobilize them and really make the community the place that we all want to live in. And so as I wrap this up and have a little bit of time, probably not as much as I wanted to for questions, I just want to tell you how one Thank you for being here. I know it's, you know, it's uh, not the best weather out here. You know, some of you got up for the early early service. You're better than I usually. You know, I can't. Oh, I can't make that early service. Uh, some of you are, are here early, so thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. I really, honestly, truly think that we are making progress. I know that the numbers don't say so yet but the systems are starting to be modified in order to address it, and that's where we need to continue the push. And if we do that, I think we'll start to continue to have the community that we all want to call home and have a home for everyone here in Rochester and Olmstead County. So with that, I will turn it to any questions and just to thank you. Go ahead. One of the things that happens here, our church, and I'm sure a lot of churches, is people that walk in, 
and um, they'll have a need. And I mean, I've had that happen to me, and to find a number to give them to call is difficult. Um, if, I mean, it would just be nice to have a poster or something in every church, or a card you could give them with all those numbers on it. And sometimes they don't want it, they just want someone to help them at the moment. But what do you uh, know about that? One, thank you for the amazing idea for like a poster or for something that we could put in all churches because that's amazing. Uh, I do think that the number I would start to tell people is 328-7175. That's our housing stability line uh, that is staffed by our social work team uh, that's trained to kind of do that input work and then trained to start to hone in on some of those housing and other issues. So I appreciate that question because it gives me another time to plug that as an opportunity. I remember uh, reading a wonderful book called The Glass Castle. I think Margaret Wharton or something um, was someone was the author. And it talked about she had gotten herself out of a hard growing up situation. Her parents ended up homeless and she went up on Fifth Avenue in New York City. And one day she decided she had to face the fact that, that her folks are still homeless and how to deal with her own story. And in the end, she got him a house and everything. I don't want to be a spoiler alert, but they went back to homelessness. How do we deal with those that just, that's their, it was their mother's choice. And how can we help that population? Thank you for that question. So the question was, how do we work with populations, and I'm summarized here, that are very service resistant, that maybe once given resources slip back into experiencing homelessness. So a couple of things. I think the first thing that there are opportunities for us as a system to improve is our kind of case management after we get people housed. So there are so many people we're working with that we get somebody into housing and then we kind of turn and work with the next one. And I remember a conversation I had with one of our outreach specialists last year, and he said, yeah, I ran into so-and-so, and, you know, I'd house, help get him a place a couple months ago, and he said, hey, why don't you ever come and see me anymore? You know, I kind of miss our talks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he said that one really hit me because it made me realize that we're so focused on bringing people up into housing that we aren't focused on maintaining and enhancing those relationships. And so, so many times, that if we don't help those, you know, it's housing with services that solves homelessness, it's not just housing. And so even by having someone and the opportunities in this, you know, for this family, right? Hey, here's, here's a house, here's everything else. If you haven't addressed any of those underlying issues, they're still there. Uh, one, of the, one of the many things I will hear from people who are experiencing homelessness that are housed for the first time in a long time is it's hard for them just to understand having four walls. You know, and these are things that, for me, I, I don't understand, but it's their story, it's their perspective, and even just, you know, being, feeling caged in sometimes because they're within the confines of four walls, and so just working through a lot of those types of issues with somebody after housing is extremely important. Yeah, the question was kind of what do we do about the perception that the camping ban kind of brings forward? And I think that's, that is a real piece. I'm not going to lie and say that, you know, one, one I'll just give a little bit of back. So the city enacted the camping ban. I work for the county, so in some ways I got to take an easy pass on this because we didn't have to come up with either a yay or nay on this issue. So I can be extremely, I can play the line very well here because what I'll say is, one, I understand what the city is trying to do. Uh, and it's extremely challenging sometimes without having uh, rules in place for some of their interactions. The challenge is going to be, you know, is that really the best tool in the tool belt? 
And I, that, that remains to be seen. And I think there could be some unintended consequences of, of what I truly do believe their intentions are, are good. Uh, and then kind of what does that, you know, what the signal that sends, I understand that that also sends a signal that we're not a welcoming community. And I, I hope that the work that we do can continue to prove otherwise, but that's still going to be a challenge. When I was traveling around, I, I was in one town that, that uh, had like a container city. And they had one building that you entered, it had the showers and all that. But the rest was just um, a localized encampment, is what it was. And, and it seems to me it could be very easy to put something like that up in several places. And I'm also thinking in Homestead County, it's not just Rochester. Anyway, I thought it's there. Are, I think we think when we build housing, we need to have this humongous, beautiful kind of, you know, very functional kind of setting. But it could be as simple as containers. Yeah. So the kind of question was about the container cities that have been you've seen, or the uh, tiny homes, pallet homes. They've been called several different things. They are. They can be a part of the solution. Uh, what we've done here is where we've had opportunities. So I'll, I'll give you one example of uh, kind of a location. Uh, Madison, Wisconsin has, they call them pallet shelters there. Uh, they did it during COVID. Uh, they put it together with some of their COVID relief funds. It was 30, essentially 30 kind of small, uh, eight by, I, I don't know the right dimensions, but they were, they were individual units, and so the idea there is that they are able to get people their individual places to stay, and then they have kind of a community, you know, because the big challenge with a lot of that is getting water in and water out, right? That's the challenge with a lot of these is uh, getting water to and from. So they handled that by kind of having a community shower and washroom setting, and so they did that. Uh, they have, that has been somewhat successful. Uh, it, it was expensive. Uh, and so it was, I think what they told us when we met with them is that it was about $1.7 million to get that set up the time you acquired the land, the shelters, and then the infrastructure needed. Oh, hit the wrong button. Oh, well. Uh, so that is something that we're continuing to look at as part of potential solutions. So that is still kind of on our plate. We've done some other things as far as buying units that have been on the market that we can use for permanent, permanent supportive housing. Uh, that have been a little bit more economical right now, but as we're looking at the big picture, that continues to be an option for us. Right, I'll shout from back here. What about public-private housing options? We're working with private development organizations that are building low-income housing in partnership with local organizations and governments. Is that something the city or the county is exploring? Yeah, the question was about public-private partnerships, and that's something that we do every day. So we probably don't go a week without talking to an affordable housing developer of some kind who's interested in the area. The biggest challenge there is financially. Uh, the reason they, they're affordable is that they're subsidized. So essentially, a market-rate housing unit, it, you know, the cost to build it is the cost that you're basically paying in rent. Uh, if it's lower than that, you need some kind of a subsidy. And so for the affordable housing developers, they come in and we always try to put things together. It's challenging. Uh, there's a lot of great developers in the community though. We work with the most, the, the largest uh, provider of uh, affordable housing in, in, in Rochester is probably the great, the late Joe Weiss. Uh, he built affordable housing year after year after year after year here. And many of the, the buildings that you see are his and he, he was a private developer who made that his mission later in life so it requires all of us and yes this was focused very much on the government side of it and actually there's a little bit more that I didn't get to today kind of on those partnerships but they're extraordinarily important is the first homes I think it was called first homes initiative still operating where you uh, you could build equity in the, in the home? Yeah, the question was about first homes. First homes not only is still going, they are thriving. They have, uh, so first homes is our community land trust. 
which means that in order to make home ownership affordable, what they have done is basically split off the cost of the land and kind of held that in a trust in perpetuity. And then the homeowner only owns the building and the structure. So essentially, they only need to have uh, equity for 75%. About 25% of the cost is the dirt, 75% of the cost is the building itself. And so because of that, I think they're getting close to 300 homes in the community land trust, but they have grown significantly. So they uh, came out of the bang maybe 10, 15 years ago, had a little bit of a lull, and now they're being able to really leverage a lot of funding sources again and have been doing great things in our community. I see the walk up, which is usually the car. <laughs> I just want to thank Dave Dunn for being with us um, this morning. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I, we will be making the entirety of Dave's presentation available 